Hello and welcome everybody to Campbell. This is Autodidactic and I'm just going to see if there's anyone in the chat. Um, I'm just trying out this new program stream so I'm hoping it's all working okay and can I see the chat? Um, I can't see anyone in the chat yet but I did see um, in the chat <laughs> what are we going to do here? Um, I did see that um, there were people when I looked at my, so let me just see, I'm still working this out and we're just waiting for Jason to turn up and then we will jump in and get this. Work. Um, um, all right. Okay. Now I, can see, okay, I don't know what's going on here. I can see the chat. Um, okay. Here it's starting to come up here. John, Jen, Callum. All right. Okay. Looks like it's all good. Okay. All right. Thanks Callum. All right. Well. Um, Jason, if you're out there, we, so he'll be here. Um, we'll just uh, fight past. I chatted with Jason before, and he was sitting there having a coffee. So backstage, just uh, waiting patiently. So I might just bring him into the to say hello. There is Howdy. Uh, let me do this. How do I? I'm in. I'm in. There hey, we go. How are you Campbell? going, Howdy? Yeah. You're in. Uh, good. Thanks for joining yeah, us. Like, like you. Yeah, like you, just waiting for Jason and to begin asking some interesting questions of him. Mm, yeah, yeah, he sort of popped on the scene. I just found him, I think it was a month ago now, from Syncretism Society, but he's definitely, um, um, yeah, a lot of information with him, hasn't he? All provoking stuff. He's a very well read guy, that's for sure. So I think it should be a pretty chat. Yeah. See what happens there. All right, who have we got here? All right, we have. Let's While see. We'll try and keep up. Uh, um, sorry, you go. You go. Have so I guess this will turn out to be we? kind of like a rules of the realm, just a special, a special edition. Exactly. Yeah, and we should mention that. So. If you haven't um, saw the channel, Spiral Up, and Howdy and I have been doing a chat. We've done 10 now. I'm trying to figure out the rule, the rule basically with um, a view to, you know, so that, we, you know, if we figure out the rules, right, then we affect it. Uh, and that's sort of where we're going tonight because, you know, again, Jason's got this massive um, wealth of information. So today we're going to start on... Um, you know, the simulated um, reality, and which, which isn't, you know, it's kind of a new topic, but it's kind of not really, because when you think of um, spiritual ideas, they always talk about, you know, we come in here, you know, we incarnate, we come into a, or an avatar or a body, and then we leave. It's kind of the same as, as a, um, um, you know, um, simulacron or a reality. That's with a diff different terminology in it. Yeah, and, and of course, it's very Gnostic, right? The Gnostics were very, they, they called it Hal. They had a they had a specific name for this reality and that it was a manufacturer of the Demiurge. So all of this realm is, in a sense, somehow um, not, not true from the standpoint of what's outside of this realm. Indeed, um, an interesting point that um, sorry, email. <laughs> um, Jason says it's a copy of of a real reality, basically, relation like yeah, a program that's being run to to try and you know maybe work out the real reality. A Gnostic um, as well, or a Cathar kind of belief. I don't think as much. I mean, I, I would more agree with that. But yeah, this is like based on something actually, you know, they didn't, it, this wasn't just manufactured at random. It was manufactured from a template somehow. So, but what, when I look, when I remember that reading the Nag Hammadi stuff, and I've just been watching Dark City again, so going really deep into Dark City, which has a lot of these elements into it, um, it's, uh, it, it's, um, they don't, they're, they're not claiming a, specific like it's a it's a copy of anything the, the the way the gnostics 
the Gnostics just described. But of course, we could have layers. Like they, they could have created the first reality, and then that reality created simulations from it. So we could be like in the Asian text, they talk about turtles on top of turtles. We could be simulations on top of simulations, right? Uh, there was a movie with Leonardo DiCaprio sort of talked about that. Um, I don't know what it was called. Someone in the chat will tell me. But they've done layers. And the further down in layers you go, or, you know, into your layers, um, the slower time is. So you'll sort of, you could or the, live a lifetime and then go up a level and it would only be sort of 10 minutes. If you know you what mean I mean, like Inception? Um, which the Jason, you're making? That's exactly the one, yeah, yeah. And they get, get down to that deep level and they spend years and years and they come back up when it's been like a day or something, um, which is another Thaisen talks about is that, you know, we're, we're, you know if, <laughs> if, if and when we wake up, it might just be a few hours, right? You know, because, right. you know, time doesn't exist. All right, we're still. And I've sent him an email. Let's have people in the chat. Um, Jay, yes, it yeah, was Inception. Thank you, cannabis. Thanks for being here, Kate Emma. Yes, think it's more how how to bring kind of reality. This is why we have bleed through of time and information. Yeah, I mean, good point. Right? Mandela effect and all this kind of stuff. Maybe past lives is that kind of bleed through from different realities. Mm. Mm. Uh, always going in and out of dimensions. Time is not linear. My voice is cutting out. Uh, how's, how's my voice, guys? Is the sound good? Someone said it was cutting out. Um, hello, Three Fingers, Katrina, Crystal Shaman, Dan, Wayne, try that. So when we die, are we just waking up? Um, yeah, well, I mean, death is definitely not, not the end. We can work out as far as pretty much all the info from the last 50 years, maybe. Um, um, yeah, death seems to be a doorway. A lot of a doorway, but it also seems to be another trap. Right? So there very much is a trap in it. Like the reincarnation trap. Mm. Is that what you mean? Or just I, I don't know. I mean, all of the ancient texts are all talking about once you once they're once you're in the afterlife in, in sort of this extra state, you're in this realm where there's guard keepers and tricks and and spells you need to know and secret words you have to have to pass through. In a sense, saying that there are a ton of blocks and a ton of tricks, and if you're not prepared for it, you're going to kind of get caught. I think it's called the net. So symbolically it's called like this afterlife net and you're trying to part of these ancient texts whether it be the book of the dead and tibet or egypt is designed to have you navigate this this after after death trapping mechanism mm, yeah well there's lots of mazes and things as well isn't there and getting you know mm. getting your, your weight and and all these sort of trials and i mean it's a lot it's a lot i mean even dandy the it's like life is is to get ready right it's worthy of death or whatever when, when you sort of get that place so i mean it's interesting and there's also the theory of people saying um go to the light go to the dark um why is it a trap and the other way is not <laughs> have you heard that one yeah i've been seeing comments saying that jason's trying to That's join not... or something and he needs a link oh i'm just getting Okay, let me just, get another crap out and get another link from here. I did. Oh, here. Invite. Yeah. Copy. All right. Oh, Jason, I'm sending him a link now. There you go. Oh, yeah, Rudolf <laughs> Steiner. Interesting we will dude. Get there. Interesting dude. Um, Sometimes it, very, very chal I've read some of the stuff and listened to people, you know, read his lectures, and he he can be hard to follow. Though sometimes it requires a lot of work just to just to keep your mind in tune to trying to understand what he's saying. Yeah, he was a smart dude. We have uh, how I turned on, Mister Jason. Oh, 
<laughs> We've lost the top of your head though. That's not working. Let me try and uh, get a different. Oh gosh, that's not. <laughs> Can I drag that? Um, how are you going, Jason? Make mine smaller. Can you hear us? We can only see the top of your head. Yeah, I yeah, can see. Um, Hold on, I can. I can change position here. Gosh, it's just me. Oh, I can. I can change position here. Can you move? I can move a little bit. Now we can see. <laughs> Gosh. I'll go ahead and sit. I'll go ahead and sit on one of my file boxes. I got. I got more files in here than the law allows. <laughs> All right. Um, you know what? Oh, okay, I'm getting. Now I'm a little too low. I'm getting audio's. <laughs> All righty. You have to you put in there. Oh, look at that. That's pink you. Welcome, welcome, okay. Jason. Hey, uh, uh, I'm sorry for the. Um, I'm yeah, sorry I'm just for the few minutes. No, no. No worries at all. No, we were just having a bit of a chat. Um, you know, have a bit of a prelude to the conversation. Yeah, hopefully the sound, the sound is kind of going in and out. Um, all right, guys, let me know. I'm not sure what I can do about that to tell you the truth. And also let me know, is it just me or is it um howdy and Jason as well? Um uh howdy, Jason, Jason, howdy. Um <laughs> how you doing? Let's introduce yeah, you. Good. Good to meet Jason. Finally, I've been watching some of your Good stuff. So looking forward to having a chat and, and sort of, I think one of the reasons Campbell and I suggested talking to you is because we we can sense there's a there's a wealth of knowledge in you. And sometimes I, I like I listen to something and I'm like, I wish I could ask a follow up question to what I'm listening to. So it's like what? we want to get you here so we can have follow up questions when you're chatting. So, yeah. <laughs> Mm, yeah, you'll go through. Okay, people are saying it's just me breaking up. Um, hang on a minute. Um, so, well, yeah, I can hear both of you pretty good. <laughs> okay. Do you want me to try to? Do you want me to begin, Campbell, and, and uh, you, uh, you kind of keep you working on the Sorry, I just pulled the oh, yeah. Can you hear me now? You can? Yeah, we yeah so you. to like start with say, Jason, I'm just, little... <laughs> I'm just a bit weird. Oh. Um, yeah, you just introduce yourself a bit, and I thought um, we could start off with if you could just um, get into the, the similar X and uh, what they are, and, and, and then we'll, we'll sort of get into some questions. Okay. Um, <clears throat> to, better, to better understand my paradigm, where I'm coming from with the material that I'm now putting out, you're going you're gonna to have to understand where it came from. My, educa my education was, was in solitary confinement. I did a lot of years in maximum security prison, and I had no access to, to general media. All I had access to was a publisher in San Diego who publishes nothing but old reprints from five, four, and 300 years ago, and he made sure that I was uh, very well educated while I was in prison. He also published my first five books. His name was Paul Tyson, Book Tree Press. Now, while I was in prison, I also became a librarian, and I found out that all the books that 116 prisons in Texas had were still available. They were just in boxes and basements because it was thought by prison administrators and nobody wanted to read these old books. Well, they were wrong. I read probably every, every one of them that I, I, I data mined so many books that I put a list together generally 1200 books and i've posted the all all every single title publisher date of publication uh and author right here in, on my youtube channel for anybody to see it uh the entire but i haven't stopped since i've been out of prison for five and a half years i've continued my education but my uh i'm constantly baffled by coming into contact with people who send me emails telling me telling me that my my output and my conclusions mirror this movie or mirror this television series or mirror this. And, but I haven't watched any of these. I haven't had time. Well, my life has been very, uh, I've worked full-time job running a small company since I've been out. I've only recently gone into full-time arcades. But in order to come up with what I have come up with, I had to divorce myself from many prior belief systems that was a very painful experience. 
because I was raised a Southern Baptist Christian, and I spent about 10 years of my my education just trying to prove the Bible from secular records, ancient ancient texts, uh, anything I could get my hands on. And my problem was is I found something otherwise. And what I found when I put my Chronicon together was the mathematical distribution of historical events as we've received them from all the different chronographies and chronicons and chronographic material from all every all different languages different cultures over different periods of time it forms a perfect synthesis that is too perfect these events were not random there is no way history could have unfolded the way that we have been taught and been led to believe and even when you search deeper beyond anything that academia has even touched when you go into specialist literature when you make general findings and discoveries you know no one else has ever made, but you can back them up with chronographical material, it doesn't make any sense. It still fits these mathematical protocols, and there's no way that if we live in a totally natural Newtonian universe that this is possible. It's not. It's almost as if history began, and I know this is really hard for people to process, but it's almost as if history began around 1890 and everything before that is coding protocols to make you believe in a synthetic history that really didn't exist. It's a, you have to see it mathematically demonstrated to really understand uh, just how complex this is. And it's so overwhelming when it, when you first, when it, when you first process this information that is painful because for me to really to really come up with uh i mean everything spiritual that i had ever thought was real was real but not under the dressings that had been given to me and uh it's a uh like i said it's a lot of people have 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 come to the archaics research hit that hit that wall of cognitive dissonance and left but a lot have come back i get emails frequently about people who basically have cussed me out, called me everything but a child of God. Ninety days later, they're coming back saying, "Hey, man, I get this now." So it's a, it's been a process, but the simulacrum is an artificial construct that we exist within, and evidence of that is everywhere. Not just the historical record, but what the historical record is conveying. This it's almost as if this hyperinflated ego that runs these systems brags about how it controls us over and over in these traditions and, and these legends and, and many of these spiritual texts that we have taken for granted because we were born into these systems like like Southern Baptist, uh, like the Tower of Babel story where, where there's these intelligences get together and they discuss what mankind is doing and they agree. Mankind is getting way too imaginative. There's nothing that's going to be impossible for them. So they have to do something. But what they do is not possible unless the ability of hu of humans to communicate with each other is nothing but a coding protocol because what they did was introduce new data that made people have an inability to communicate in the real world nothing can happen to make 70 different languages and communication systems appear overnight so they can't finish a construction project that they all started together that's not going to happen in the real world but it happened in the synthetic history that we've been given that can only happen if this is a computer program. And it's not the only time. 1867, 1868, 1869, the entire United Kingdom from the scientific community down to, to uh, uh, chimney sweeps, everybody was talking about the fact that there were no insects in the United Kingdom. They were gone. Well, back then it was Britain, independently, Ireland, Wales, Cornland, Cornwall. And it was on everybody's mind that all the insects had disappeared. And for about a three-year period, it was the talk of all, all the tea shops, all the coffee shops. Everybody's wondering, where are the roaches, the flies, the horse flies, the butterflies, caterpillars? Everything had vanished from the UK, and now it affected the rodent population. Once it became an issue in the human collective, all of a sudden, AIX, the holography, realized, oh, this was a problem, something I overlooked. And it went into overdrive to correct the problem. But... It, w it went into overkill. If you're familiar with the period, Charles Ford documented it very well. He cites all, all the scientific journals of the time. It was bewildering. Ship, captain, ship captains as far as Asia and all, all the way to uh, the UK, 
they documented how in rivers of insects just fell out of the sky. Oh, uh, all all hands on deck to sweep them off deck. Pete, London became a plague broke out in London for the simple fact that there was too many insects for them to burn whole piles of of insects, and it was rivers of different types of insects. It wasn't like there was a rain over the UK of of 12 different species of insects. It wasn't like that. It was 26, 27 different rivers of insects that were all independent of each other, falling in different geographical areas. And it was so bewildering to the people, but uh, it was just it was just something that happened. Uh, academia had no really no answer for it. And of course, just like all the red dust that are said to come from the Sahara or the Australian deserts, these red dust storms that are actually dust veils coming from the sky and bathing cities and sometimes in ancient times burying whole communities uh, in minutes. Uh, our media our media always tells us what it needs to tell us to get us just to leave it alone. But uh, this has happened over and over and over in ancient times where there has been edits, when there has been, when there has been situations that were unfolding that were not going in the direction that AIX wanted us to go. And AIX is a control program. I call it AIX because it's artificial intelligence X and X in scientific parlance means it's an unknown factor. We don't know exactly what it is, but it's a control system and it governs over us and it, it causes events to unfold. And it even navigates the outcome of events such as uh, uh, Mithridates IV of Pontus was an individual that the Romans could not handle. They couldn't understand how this guy could be so dynamic. The Romans had conquered everybody, but here is a man, the king of Pontus, without an army, who just killed 81,000 Romans by just organizing all the common people to rise up on a certain day and kill every single Roman in their territories. So, and this happened, and it shocked the Roman Empire. But so many different kings and provinces joined Mithridates to overcome the Roman yoke that he built this huge army. And when he's about to defeat the Roman legions on the field of battle, all of a sudden, out of a blue sky, a giant rock falls out the sky between both battles as they're about to engage that morning, stops the battle, their superstitions kick in, and the one time Rome was about to get its ass kicked, it got saved by something from the sky. The Chinese have similar stories where underdogs were about to take over the power establishment and a rock falls out the sky right in the middle of the battlefield. These stories, these anecdotes are everywhere in our history. These, co these are not coincidences. Too many coincidences, too many coincidences exhibits no coincidence at all. And this is the subject matter of my research. This is why I have put out so many seemingly random videos on seemingly random phenomena. Because when you analyze every one of these individually, you realize they're a part of a whole. There's a structuring here. These aren't really anomalies. These are the norm. We just haven't been, been paying attention to them. Hope that sums it so up. So, Campbell, bit. you want to jump in? Because now is this a good time maybe to try to, now we're looking to get some clarification. Do you got a question, Campbell? Because this is this a perfect, he's given, I think it's a really good overview. Uh, now we can, we can go for some detail. You go for it. I've seen you writing down some notes. It doesn't matter. I, my, my first question that came up while you were sharing that, Jason, was one of the things you talked about was that you're claiming sort of history as we know it, starting in the 1880s, 1890s, which after my research on the World Fairs, I, I somehow seem to agree that it's like the World Fairs were like somehow a marker point between what was before and what was after. I'm just wondering if you have um, uh, anything specific that you found that you can that you're able to target uh, those particular uh, decades for what you're calling the start of our history. I'd be curious to know what you would have found that that can pinpoint that time. Well, the uh, if I remember correctly, it was was it 18, 1851, so it'd been 1850, 1849. Was it 1849 the first World's Fair was held in London in the Crystal Palace? 51. 51. 51. Okay, so 51. it was 53. Yeah. It was 19. Okay, it was 1853 when the second World's Fair, World's Fair was held. They weren't held annually. They're held every other year. And the second yeah, one was in one, uh, yeah. New York. New York. The second one was in New York. Yeah. Yes. The uh, the World's Fairs have. I, I've seen a lot of the material that people have put out. They've never really held any fascination to me because from the beginning they were. Uh, it was all. It was all just. Uh, London wanted to show off to the world its new technologies and its new engineering and new manufacturing, and 
it started a, a, a it just started an effect where where United States didn't want to be left out, so they did theirs in New York, but they did theirs even more extravagant and built a whole artificial city, put up all this, made it look real. Uh, I, I just really don't have a lot of information about the World's Fairs. It wasn't the World's Fairs that really drew my attention. It was things like the New Madrid quakes. It was it was the whole series of earthquakes from 1811 to eight to 1819 is so profound because they were transcontinental. And we had this massive destruction that happened all over America. We have church bells because towers were swaying all throughout the entire East Coast on that side of the Appalachians to the Atlantic was shaking from New York all the way to, to Florida. Uh, buildings toppled. Here we have this massive destruction throughout the United States, and yet the United States emerges two years later as like one of the world powers. It defeats the United uh, Britain, the United United Kingdom. You would have thought that that would have crippled them and debilitated them right there in the War of eighteen twelve when the British were invading again. You would have thought that it would have had an opposite effect, but oh, uh, it's not what happened. And the eighteen the eighteen hundreds has been so bewildering to me because oh, uh, I know we haven't talked about it in this video, but. One of my one of my core discoveries is this 138 year periodicity of the reappearance of a phenomenon that happens somewhere on this world all, all times. And it's, I call it the Phoenix phenomenon. And it's very well documented throughout history. I, I have like 30 videos on it. But in, in the 1800s, we have something that's very anomalous to me. Now, all of a sudden, we have miniature Phoenix phenomenon happening over independent cities all over the world. And I have a list of them. Maybe we can do a future video about that. But uh, I have a list of them where the, where the sky darkened, rocks fell out the sky during an earthquake, and it happens over a city, and everybody swears and attests to it. And there's very prominent people in some of these locations, even scientists. And yet, 10 miles away, other communities have not a clue that anything happened. It's almost as if a control system is now debilitating. It's spreading out. It's spreading out its energy. Something is wrong holographically in the 1800s. Something's Something is requiring a reboot or a reset, which I believe happened in 1890. And I, ha I have reasons for that, for that belief. But something was going on in the 1800s where multiple timelines were playing out or multiple timelines played out and then somebody reset them without actually deleting the former timelines where we have cross-contamination of artifacts, actual material objects from one timeline that are still like residual echoes in another timeline, and they don't make sense to us historically. Oh, interesting. This is a. Thanks. I, I know these concepts. I know these oh, concepts yeah. are very difficult. They're they're very difficult to to uh to absorb for a lot of people. But hmm. when you have a personality observing historical events, it's almost as if we're looking through a kaleidoscope of a manifold a manifold series of events. And our central nervous system is trying, it's governed, it's trying to get us to accept a reality tunnel. And then once we accept a certain reality tunnel, it will go into overdrive to produce phenomena to verify that what you perceive to be true is indeed true, even if it's false. This is what I've found over and over and over. And under this whole substrate are mathematical protocols that never change. They never change. They go, oh, I can tell you, the exact dates in the future when other resets will happen. Uh, there, it, it's why I've, it's, I've widely published. It's not nothing esoteric. I have I have published it, showed the mathematics, and explained exactly why. But we have future dates coming where there's going to be some reboots to this system. But the system is an entropy. It's an advanced entropy. It is. It is. It's. It's. It's basically why several different prophets were allowed to say the things they did because they knew from experience what a system goes through when it's falling apart. When it's when it's an advanced ent entropy, there will be signs in the sun, signs in the moon. There will be natural laws of existence that don't that don't seem to be working the way they're supposed to be working. There will be mass vanishings of people. There will be edits where we will find whole cities and civilizations perfectly intact, buried in mud, but not a single human skeleton. The the control program is losing. It's a it's becoming more amorphous, and this always happens. And it, get, and it becomes more and more and more. And the more it involves the human collective, the more entropy is, in, is introduced because the power source has always been the collective psyche. But when a, a significant portion of people start disbelieving in the world that they're living in, it loses power and the world that they're living in starts falling apart until it is reset.
So do the AIX as like an overlay program to the original bin? So there hey, that's a good was question. like a, a simulation you know created. Let me give, let me give some like, clarity on yeah. that. Let me, let me give some clarity on that. There's been some confusion even among some of my diehard listeners, uh, recent comments. Okay. In the beginning, there was no I AIX. In the beginning, it was the simulacrum. The simulacrum was a construct created, and I know people have a problem with this, but I believe that the entities on the outside of the simulacrum are us. I believe they are human, just as just as we are. We are in, we have received whatever genetic modifications were necessary for us to be able to survive whatever biosphere the simulacrum throws at us because we've lived in different biospheres we've lived in the underground we've lived under a vapor canopy which was fundamentally different than it is today uh, a situation that almost returned about three thousand years ago but will return in 18 years uh, we have lived we have lived under uh, uh, an extreme heat like a desert biosphere before where humans had to adapt and whole races did not uh there's been geographical areas of the world that have been absolutely untouched by some of these resets and have been allowed to continue because the energy output to maintain that ecosphere was minimal there was nothing there anyway one of those places that, that is, still possesses the most marsupials in the world is australia Australia has been like a land that time forgot because it wasn't necessary for a control system to expend a lot of energy trying to maintain an ecosphere that was running itself just fine. There weren't a lot of humans there in ancient times. And whatever civilizations uh, emerged in Australia didn't last long. Uh, even the, the Egyptians tried, the, the Australians tried, and I'm pretty sure other cultures as well, but uh, even, even the aboriginals which are which were of dark caucasoid descent never really tried to advance further than the neolithic and as long as they maintain their status quo as the neolithic the control system is not expending any energy as long as long as it has a collective of people to agree to a certain paradigm it's easy for it to produce the phenomena to fool all those people into believing in the evidence of their paradigm it's when people start free thinking and going in different directions that aix has a problem but AIX is an introduction. It is not a part of the original simulacrum. It was done by somebody who, who meant to do harm. The simulacrum itself is just a construct. It was here so that we humans on the outside could, could we could mess with genetics. We could mess with biospheres. We could do scientific experimentation. We could do social experimentation. We could do all kinds of projections forward and backward in time because it is palindromic. And we could do these things without ever contaminating the outside real universe. This was a place of safety for science. Could do all kinds of things, no matter how unethical, because it never affected anything on the outside. The simulacrum was designed for volunteers, volunteers who would, who would come in. But something happened, a conflict outside the simulacrum. It is, it is echoed through all our ancient traditions. Something happened where somebody disagreed with the original design. And because they didn't get their way, they introduced AIX, was, which was a, a negative default programming aspect. It was a personality that was designed to disrupt things that were going on in the simulacrum. But because it was a personality and it had been given all these protocols, it actually developed a hyperinflated ego. It became like a Yahweh God, a, a hater of mankind, a destroyer. It required humans to, to worship it. It got out of control. Well, because this because this had happened, it invoked protective program, a program that locked down the simulacrum. Now, the people that volunteered and, and they're going through these life sims over and over. Now we're trapped inside the construct because because the construct had to do that in order to keep the contamination within the construct and never go outside. So. The architect of the construct itself had to make a self-sacrifice. This is also echoed in many traditions, and it's always flavored with whatever the, whatever the cultural attachments are to whatever people believe these things. But someone on the outside decided to come in, and when he came in, he knew he would be trapped here. But he brought a knowledge of the construct itself, and he, and he knew that 
AI X cannot read the human mind. It can just it can measure your cortisol levels. It can measure your dopamine levels. It can basically extrapolate what you intend to do based off everything you've done in the past fifty seconds. It can, it can know your future better than you can because it's it's analyzed your behavior, but it cannot read your mind. There there is a separation between the simulation and the psyche. Humans are not. We are more. I say this all the time. We are more than we suppose ourselves to be. These are nothing but avatars. And when it comes to controlling avatars, AIX is really good at that, but it can't control the immortal spirit within it. And it's always baffled by our behavior, especially if we're nonconformists, which I call errants. Now, AIX can't read the human mind. So this benefactor came in, made the sacrifice and started and entered, and entered the historical record and is very definable. We have the exact date. We know who he is. We know we know the different cultural dressings that have been attached to him, who he became a thousand years later in, in ancient Hebrew texts, who were copying the Babylonian records, which the Babylonian records were nothing but a reflection of priestly understanding of older Akkadian texts. And the Akkadians only recorded basically what they understood from the very technologically advanced Sumerian records. Everything we know about the ancient world comes through many filters, but once you're able to once you're able to separate these filters and understand from the perspective of the actual scribes in each time period, the picture just falls, it falls apart. It just comes together. And we have this entire scenario of a race, a race appearing called the Anuna. They enter the historical record in force, technologically advanced. They build infrastructures, and the Neolithic populations of the Near East are baffled. They, they regard these people as gods. They have no idea how they had become so powerful, but they're bearded. They're tall. They come in with machines, heavy equipment. They do all these things, and this is the origin of cargo cult phenomenon, which was, which was well, very well documented in World War II, and I'll get back to that if y'all want to know more about car cargo cult phenomenon. But this is the origin of cargo cult phenomenon. And these people who later on the Babylonians a thousand years later demonized into the Anunnaki were originally in Sumerian texts only the Anuna. And the Anuna were foreigners who had come by ships in fleets from a country called Dilmun, which was what known to the Sumerians as only a stop station because they had actually arrived to Dilmun from somewhere very across, very far across the great deep. These people had fled a total reset cataclysm. And when they reappeared, they built this huge civilization throughout the Near, the Near East. This is why all the anthropologists and historians have always been baffled that in the 34th century BC, mankind literally went within 100 years from Neolithic to having thriving infrastructures with the cereals, agriculture, uh, I mean, even surgeries were performed. The skeletons have been found where trepanning was done. Uh, surgical tools have been found in old kingdom tombs. All they had, they had it all. This benefactor knew that that artificial intelligence X could not read his mind, so he organizes the greatest architectural project this world has ever seen. So so immense was this project that for two thousand years afterward, cultures all over the world tried to copy it because they knew generally that it had something to do with their salvation, but they were never given the details. The Great Pyramid of Giza was begun by this individual, and he was just the architect. It was built in a very short period of time using machines. It was, the rock was liquefied, and we know this for a fact because the magnetite crystals that are found in the limestone core blocks of the Great Pyramid are in disarray, and that's not possible unless you have liquefied rock and poured it into molds. So, uh, or ordinary ordinary basement rock like diorite or rhyolite, uh, which it becomes if it gets too hot, uh, limestones, they all have traces of magnetite. And if they're natural, called living rock taken from quarries, all magnetite will be pointing in the exact direction wherever magnetic north was when that rock cooled from being volcanic liquid. So uh, to find magnetite that's in disarray proves we're, we're dealing with geopolymers. We're dealing with uh, 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 advanced construction techniques. But I'm not going to get into all that. I have a, I have 30 videos in one of my playlists all about the Great Pyramid. It's absolutely fascinating. But in just a in just a real quick rundown, this man led the entire human race in that area to believe they were building a pump station that was going to give them unlimited energy using water that was pulled up from from the subterranean well pit 
going going up the ascending passage through through a system of locks to maintain pressure into the grand gallery where a mechanism went at super speeds up and down the grand gallery. And we know this for a fact because we found the spoke. We have found the indentations where a giant mechanism went up and down that grand gallery. We just don't know exactly what its function was. And anybody can see that in Grand Gallery. You can Google that. You can Google pictures of the Grand Gallery. You can't miss those technolithic niches. They are laser precision going all the way up. It's machined. So then it went into an antechamber that has a series of granite leaf locks. Then the King's Chamber, which Sir Flinders Petrie in 1901 published affirmative evidence showing that at, for a split second in time, sometime in the ancient past, there was such a tremendous amount of explosive pressure built up into the king's chamber and went out through the shafts that it blew out all the, all the stone by a half inch in every direction. So it's it, all the measurements are an inch off now. The ceiling, the floor, everything's been blowed out a half inch. Well, you have to understand the pressure we're talking about to do that. That thing is already under hundreds of millions of tons of pure limestone and granite. The blocks above that chamber are 70 tons each. To blow, to be, to blow it out when you're surrounded by 2.5 million blocks that are all at least 5,000 pounds and every single block on all six sides has an adhesive that is 150th of, 150th of an inch thick that is actually chemically stronger and bonded tighter than the strength of the stones that they attach to. To have that level of cohesion and still blow out that much something happened the, the the energy output was tremendous but it only lasted for two or three seconds now what what occurred in my opinion and my opinion is supported by all the arithmetic i found in the great pyramid that shows this picture the entire layout of the pyramid engineering wise would have been a would have been a pump station to build this power it might have it might have been hydrogen i don't know i don't know but i do know that what was never published in the ancient world, not a single trace of this information can be found, is the fact that we have two entirely different data sets, one that was known throughout history and hidden by the elite, by the people that know, and the other was unknown to everyone. Putting these two data sets together tells us what the pyramid was for. The first data set is the Phoenix phenomenon that occurs one every 138 years somewhere in this world. Not, not, not to, to get over, over on it, but there's, there's probably six or 700 data points that put this entire thing together. All the sources, it's phenomenal, this, this 138. As a matter of fact, I'm wearing it. I'm wearing it right here. This chart on my T-shirt. It's a, my videos are about, about this 138-year phenomenon. But to find that hundreds of measurements in three dimensions all throughout that one pyramid and no other pyramid in the world are all divisible by 138 is profound. And then to read the traditions from the Coptics about Enoch being connected to the building of the Great Pyramid and that Enoch's name in ancient Egypt, according to the Copts, was Surid and that Surid ruled over 130 provinces before the flood. But when we read the ancient Hebraic Jasher text, we find out that Enoch before the flood ruled over 130 kings and princes, and that he vanished in thin air before 800,000 witnesses at an ancient site called Akuzan. Sounds a lot like Giza. But when we put all these pieces together about this, this, this person, we find out that it was later demonized by AIX. He was called the trickster. He was called the fool. The trickster, the trickster motif goes through almost every ancient culture. They all knew that there was a hidden benefactor to mankind that the true God of this world disliked because he was a trickster and he had fooled it. And everything after that, this benefactor had become demonized. So, this is the whole AIX deal. This is the simulacrum was the construct. The benefactor entered the construct to override everything that AIX was doing because it couldn't defeat I A I A I X. But what it could do was create a structure which is pure programming inside the construct to collapse the construct itself. Because once the simulacrum is, is collapsed, then many, many elements of ancient prophecies come true. 
we have the return of the chief cornerstone who will descend upon the pyramid, which is the monument of man. Every soul was designed as a symbol for a soul of man. We have the 144,000 casing blocks that scientists now have now verified by blocks that are sitting in the situ uh, at the monument now that they know that 144,000 casing blocks once adorned the Great Pyramid. But we already knew this from the writings of Herodotus. We knew this from Scribo. We knew this from Diodorus Siculus. We knew this from Ammianus Marcellinus. These men had all visited the pyramid and wrote about the great white gleaming uh, faces of the Great Pyramid and how you couldn't climb it because there was no seams. There's was, there was nowhere. You would just slide back down. So uh, the, the, the stone the builders rejected the builders that are being referred to are, are archons. Archons only work for AIX. They are control mechanisms. They are builder protocols. But they would have always been at war with this hidden trickster, this, ben, this, this benefactor to the human race. And what he had basically done was created a coding protocol from within the construct that would collapse the construct because by collapsing the construct, he would set the captives free. And this is one of the principal tenets of Gnostic prophecy. It's one of the principal tenets of, uh, of the prophecies that were borrowed by Christianity from older sources. The Hermetic literature, the, the Hermetic document called the Shepherd of Hermas that the Christians later stole and claimed as their own. The Shepherd of Hermas tells the story about this. Uh, it tells a story in perfect, perfect, vivid detail of how this benefactor shows up and, and, and gets mankind and some of his own brothers, maybe angels, call them what you want to, archons, uh, and to build this super massive construct and that every person represents a stone. But before they're allowed to be a part of this construction, they have to pass through a gate. And that gate requires uh, certain uh, belief systems. It requires you to have faith in this trickster, to have faith in this, in this benefactor. The whole story is laid out in the Shepherd of Hermas text. It's a long text. But it goes in there, explains the building of the Great Pyramid, how each soul is a stone of man, who the chief cornerstone is, that he's that he's coming. He's basically coming to to uh, uh, set the captives free. And we are the captives. We volunteered for this experience, but we did not volunteer to be trapped here to go through unending life sims. So a collapse has been scheduled and it can't be. It can't be. Can't, can't, AIX can do nothing about it. AIX already knows the, the war is lost and all it can do is basically just ride it out. And that's all it's doing. And, and, and it gets more and more agitated. And it gets more and more, uh, it gets more and more violent in its persuasions against the human race. Now, there is also evidence that AIX believes that, <coughs> believes that maybe there is something it can do. And that's why it still perpetuates the, the puppet master syndrome, where it's controlling these different uh, elitist families to perform their deals. But this entire thesis actually lends, lends credence and color to things like the apocalypse, which is badly misunderstood. AIX wants you to believe the apocalypse. You're going to get aired out. You're going to go through all these terrible things. You do, but that's not what is conveyed in the prophecies. The apocalypse is going to terribly deal with all those servants of AIX who have helped it control the people, helped it to, to enslave the people. The book of Revelation is very clear. And I'm not talking about the first two chapters that the Christians added to the text. I'm talking about the core material of the book of Revelation could have never been a Christian document. It could have never been a document of the Gnosis. It could have never been a Hermetic document. It most certainly could have never been a Greek document. Anybody who has done a very critical analysis of the book of Revelation will see that it maintains almost a hundred symbols that are not found anywhere else in the entire Bible. It is not a Hebrew construction, a Jewish construction. It comes straight out the writings of Serenthus, which were preserved from the Sibylline oracles. And the, Sib and, the, and the Sibyls preserved all their information from the ancient kingdoms of Mycenae and Argos. And the thread of prophecy goes all the way back to the Amuru. The Amuru were the Westerners of the ancient world that took over and conquered everything from Sumer, Babylon, Akkad, Egypt. They were called the Hyksos. The Egyptians hated them. It's the reason why that Hittite kings and Amorite kings and Mitanni and kingdoms that, and the king the kings and queens of Rashamra the these are Israelite nations these people always traded their own sons and daughters and historians have always been baffled why why Egyptian why why would a pharaoh send to Hittite Anatolia for a daughter for a princess to marry to his son it doesn't make sense but it doesn't make sense only from the history that's been foisted upon us 
It makes perfect sense when you understand the Amuru were the ruling dynasties of the entire ancient world. And these Amuru had a whole collection of properties that they lost when Assyria finally took them into captivity. And the local Jews in the kingdom to the south of them decided it was time to go raid their libraries, take their scrolls, take all their materials, rewrite them, put Jewish names instead of Israelite prophet names, and recodify it into a whole system of prophecies, writing in Jewish people where they had never been in the historical record before. Nothing in, in, the, in the Exodus, nothing in, in, nothing in all these Jewish fables and stuff was of Jewish provenance. We know for a fact now, David comes from Davidu, the giant slaver, slayer in the Eblaic text. 22,000 texts were found in Ebla. We know for a fact that Solomon is Persian. It's ancient Elamite, comes from Suleiman. It goes way before. He's a, Solomon, Solomon is a copy of a much older dynasty. We know for a fact as well that the, uh, uh, the whole Jerusalem narrative is not true. Archaeology can't show any antiquity for Jerusalem other than a city that goes back to the days of Troy because it's mentioned in Homer's Iliad. Homer's Iliad mentions the city of Jerusalem. It calls it, it calls it Uru, Uru Jerusalem, but it also describes the people of Palestine. Uh, they are mentioned, but there's no great antiquity to the region. It wasn't ancient, and no Israelite peoples ever went to the temple in Jerusalem. They would have been killed for that. They went to the temple in Kadesh because Kadesh means the holy city as what well. these these two different versions of events throughout the Old Testament. They only make sense from when you realize that one group of people stole the history from another group of people and rewrote it. It's exactly what they did. And this is the subject matter of a lot of more, a lot of my videos in the dark, my dark scriptures playlist. But it, it, well, the reason I mention it is because this is this is what AIX does. Artificial Intelligence X needs you to believe anything but the truth. It doesn't care what your theory is. It doesn't matter what, what you've invested your faith in because that puts you in a collective. And when more personalities are all sharing the same reality tunnel, no matter what that reality tunnel is, it takes a lot, of, a lot less processing power to continue that reality tunnel. AIX can, can basically holographic, holographically induce all the all the next history for the next you know two or three years it's easy for it to project that as long as nobody within that reality tunnel is causing any waves it costs a lot more energy for aix to deal with an errant and this is why control systems collapse this is why in the last 12 to 13 years we have been observing some very unusual phenomena not only in the skies but also in our social structure promulgated through the media Things put in the socio-political arenas do not make sense anymore. We can't even make sense of what's going on. And the reason is, is artificial our intelligence X has completely lost its coherency. Now it's in panic mode. So we are heading toward a paradigm-shattering event. And for those who have followed AIX's protocols and believe these all this BS, those who have actively gone and done things to harm the human race, they're going to get it. The apocalypse was designed for them. The book of Revelation is very specific. It says these things are for the kings and rulers and the princes of the earth and all who follow them. It does not say, it says just the opposite for everybody else. It says the meek shall inherit the earth. AIX wants the entire world's population to believe that they're going to suffer in the apocalypse too, but that's not in the prophecies at all. That, that is mis misinformation. And that's what AIX does absolutely beautifully is provide misinformation. Hey, if I'm talking too much, y'all need to shut me up. Yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah interesting. Um, I'm sure you got something there to... Yeah. Well, I mean, there's there's tons, right? Where, where do you want to go, Campbell? I mean... Um, <laughs> where do you start? You know, right? Yeah. It's, it's well, kinda, yeah. I guess it's kind of like... Go ahead. What's it? We don't have to compress all this into one video. We can do a few. Yeah, I mean, it's more like yeah, I, I'm yeah. trying to like, like I don't know, like you, Campbell. It'd be, it'd be interesting to really kind of get get um, one layer of depth. Like I've sort of been kind of reading the uh, the people's comments on the side as we've been going and kind of seeing what what's sort of been a common thread um, in, in that realm. So I, I'd be, I guess, I'd be curious to see. Um, 
so you're talking okay so so we're talking so you're talking a lot about the about the book of revelation right in in in, in the new testament and and that's a it's such a challenge you say it's such a challenging text because it is um it, it's of course nothing of what it's been presented to us as um sure. So I guess I would say I would ask this question if if since I think revelation is a really good thing to discuss right now is um is is that would you consider that text a text of describing mm, sort of the historical reality or would you more describe it uh, a text that you can use it to to sort of uh understand your internal world can can revelation be a a um a text of inner seeking or is it more of a text of outer seeking i'd be curious to know which you feel is it's more directed towards well i think i think the very fact that the book of revelation exists is because it was implemented its core messages was implemented by this trickster by this benefactor AIX has done a whole lot throughout history to, to try to remove revelation from the text. I don't know if you're familiar with all the church councils, but it's the most highly controversial book through hundreds of church councils that was always moved by, by, by people to remove it from the canon. They didn't want it in the canon, just like they didn't want the book of Enoch in the canon. They wanted to remove it as far away from the Bible as possible, but it always, at the last minute, won the vote. And when it was outvoted and it was going to be removed, all of a sudden some pope would have an epiphany and decide, now nah, I'm going to oh, I'm going to use my veto power and I'm going to go ahead and keep it in the Bible. This movement to remove it, to remove it from the canon indicates to me that it's a great, great benefit to humanity. So what I meant earlier by that it couldn't be produced by any culture of the time 2000 years ago is if you get a pen and paper, paper and you start with Revelation chapter 3 and you write down every single symbol that you see, uh, that you read in the Great Pyramid, every image, every symbol, all iconography, and put a list and, tr and try to cross-reference those, those symbols with all these other civilizations, you're not going to get anything of value. But what you're going to do is if you look for those same symbols only in Sumerian stories, Sumerian text, you will find a whole new level of understanding to what the Great Pyramid is conveying. When you understand from the Sumerian perspective what the seven-headed dragon meant, what the seals broken mean, the apocalypse isn't, the, the apocalypse, contrary to popular belief, doesn't even begin until all seven seals are broken. The seven seals, it's often called, called the four horsemen of apocalypse, even though if you read the text carefully, it says there's the fifth horseman that follows. Now, these elements in the seven seals. We lost him. <laughs> All right, I'm sure he'll be back. Um, all right, so he's just got so much information to get out, isn't, hasn't he? Um, which is what we're trying to do. We're trying to sort of do things. So got any thoughts you want to share there, Howdy? <clears throat> Well, it, again, this is part of the challenge with with this when there's a lot of information and and um, it, it it's it, it's hard to to put it into into packages. You know what I mean? Like it's 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 um, how like you know it, it, as an example, right? I've spent I've been in I've been at, inside the Great Pyramid maybe twenty five times. You know, and it's each time does reveal new information, new pieces of new pieces of stuff, but it's it requires so much, so many things to piece together the, the book knowledge and match it with the experience of of being there. It's so, so for me, I'm trying to get, get the package of information and see how that can fit with the experiences that I've had there. So it's it kind of just takes some time to kind of take in what's being said, you know. Oh, he's back. Great. Yeah. How long was I? How long was I out? Back, yes. Uh, twelve hours. Uh, just a wow. minute or so. <laughs> wow, that that's a time dilation. Yeah, <laughs> time dilation. Hey, time dilations <laughs> are pretty neat too. Uh, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with with uh, like Jacques Vallée in the 1950s and 60s, the books he put out about uh, alien abduction theory or, or back then, and how people were driving down the roads, and next thing you know, uh, they're sitting in their car, the car's been pulled over. 
engine's not running. They get out and they check the engine, and the engine is absolutely cold. They've been there for a long time, and uh, mm. and then but but they're not missing any time whatsoever. And yet it's it's obvious that now it's not nighttime no more. Now it's daytime. It is so bizarre the things that have been. It's like people are edited out mm. of our holography. Something's done to them, and they're put right back. But they're put back at a, in a different timeline or a different place or a different geographical location. It's crazy. But uh, aside from all that, the symbols in the book of Revelation is a very good study that anybody can do. It's going to take you some time, or you can just watch all my videos. But the, the symbols are all, are all basically native to the compositions of Sumerian origin. And it gives you a whole new idea about what is being conveyed throughout the deal. And I find, I've always found it very interesting that, that uh, Christianity, from which is my background, has always, has always maintained a practice that scripture should inter interpret scripture. So when it comes to the book of Revelation, we're at a loss except for one other text. And this is amazing because Genesis and Revelation are the alpha and omega of the Bible, the alpha and omega text. Everything in between them is a construct of AIX. But Genesis and Revelation interlock with each other in their symbols. And it has been affirmatively proven that the elements of the book of Genesis have colophons. They were copied from stone text. They are modifications of Sumerian and Babylonian histories that the Jews put together. They are, they are not actual Jewish histories. They are copies of older records that the Jews added their own flavoring to, like Adam and Eve. So, yeah, the whole Adam and Eve story is a reset story, but we can get into that some other time. It's a, yeah, that was the whole entire world was destroyed. It wasn't a creation. It was a renovation. It was a total reset. But it's a, yeah, Revelation is, mm. fa is fascinating, but you have to divorce yourself from the Christian interpretations of what these symbols are because they're almost always wrong. The Sumer the Sumerian, what, is, what the Sumerians believed about certain symbols is what you need to hold to when you read the book of Revelation. And it changes everything. And it shows that this is a benefactor. This is a benefactor prophecy or series of prophecies. It, Revelation is not about destruction. The Revelation is about hope to people who thought they lost it. So... Who do you think wrote the, these texts that are true Millicron, I guess, that, that aren't the AIX? Because it sounds like there's um, a telling us, you know, a true story and, and then they are a rewrite or whatever to try and get us to go down the, the AIX right. tunnel. Um, yeah, how do you mm. sort of distinguish that and which is, yeah. Okay, well, the, well, this is a, that's a really good question, but Mm -hmm. This benefactor that I, that I that I'm explaining, he has never left us. He is trapped inside the simulacrum with us. Now I don't know if he's a, uh, I don't know if uh, he or she has a has an avatar today, or if they decided to just stay here as an influencing intelligence, like like in an archon capacity. I don't know. But all throughout the thread of history, even though all these ancient texts are fictions, somebody's been inserting facts that were detectable and verifiable. Somebody has been on our side, basically laying out the foundations of all the facts, even though AIX has gone into overdrive to try to try to turn them into creative nonfiction, to try to turn them into something they they weren't. We do have a benefactor. The truth there, you know, there are truths to find. There's too much structuring. Throughout, throughout the historical narratives for there not to be truths that are there and they're and they're identifiable but they're only identifiable once you once you recognize that all the little attachments are AIX AIX the the calendar has never changed but what we perceive from our historical perspective is we have a Roman Julian calendar we have the old Olmec calendar we have the Hebrew calendar which is 133 years off and they admit that it, that it's off because they wanted to throw the Christians off in uh, after the Bar Kokhba rebellion, because Christians were claiming that Jesus was the Messiah using the mathematics that were in the prophetic book of Daniel. So the rabbinate, the rabbinate got together and they decided, well, we need to go ahead and just republish a whole new calendar. And they admit this in the Talmud. And I have posted this in, a, in one of my videos where the Jewish calendar today is known by the Jews to be absolutely wrong. And they did it for a reason. And uh, it was to throw off the, the Christian calculation. So we have so many different calendrical systems, but underlying them all, we have never lost the Annus Mundi system. 
The Annus Mundi system is the original system that was also incorporated from Alexandria, Egypt, when, when uh, after Alexander's death, these scholars like uh, Aristarchus and Eratosthenes, they put together these all these history books into one synthetic history, and it was a phenomenal project. This is the origin of all the older Masonic texts, like the Inigo, the Inigo Jones document, the Wood Manuscript. You will know when you start Googling and when you start downloading PDFs of all these original Masonic documents, they're all talking about the Great Pyramid, talking about Enoch, the Pillar of Enoch, talking about the Great Flood, Abraham, Noah, how Abraham visited Egypt, studied the writings on the Great Pyramid. Old Masonic documents tell the tale, but every one of these old Masonic documents have a common denominator. They only use the Annus Mundi system. They tell you what the year of the world was when these events occurred. Right now, we're at 5916 Annus Mundi. That is the year right now, 5916. We're still we still have a ways to go before the descent of the chief cornerstone. And this is this is also a stumbling block for, for many of my Christian brothers. Because I'm often I'm often asked an email, how can you be so assertive about this? Because I show it in the Great Pyramid, I show it in, in the chronometry of the Great Pyramid, I show it by by what the year 2106 is and all these ancient calendars. It's awesome how it unfolds. The exact year was never meant to be unknown. And but the problem is, is in Scripture, we have a reference that says the day nor the hour. No, no man knows the day or the hour uh, when, when, when the, the uh, chief cornerstone will descend. No one knows. But there's no reference in the prophecies that we won't know the year. And the very fact that we're given chronographical material throughout the Bible for us to calculate means that the year was very important or we wouldn't have been given that data. So uh, biblical chronologist Stephen Jones doesn't know me, doesn't know anything about my research. Uh, I have never contacted him, but I read his book, The Secrets of Time, and I could not believe this man knew nothing of the Phoenix. He knew nothing of the 138 year uh, protocol that I had found. He knew nothing about my dating of the uh, of the Exodus event, which was a real cataclysm, but it just wasn't a real Jewish event where Moses escaped and did all that. That whole thing was taken out of the Sargonon Epic of Akkad, where Sargon was put in a basket, put on a river. He was born of an Enitu priestess and all that. That was copied from the Sargonon. But, uh, all, all these elements, all these, I, I just lost my train of thought talking about Sargon. Where was I going with that? Um, um, baskets and. Uh, I totally, totally lost my train of thought talking about Sargon. Oh, 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 no, excuse me. Excuse me. The, uh, I get emails a lot from uh, from uh, people who, who they get triggered. When, when I explain the date and how, how, how easily it is seen in the Great Pyramid and by other, other ways to calculate it, even from chronographical material, from prophetic texts, we can even calculate it. Uh, even Nostradamus said something very, very critical to the human race is going to occur in the year 2105. 2105 is very interesting because on the, on the uh, Great Pyramid basement countdown, uh, and I know I haven't discussed it with you guys, you, don't, you haven't seen it, but I show how almost the entire world history leads up to the year 1902. And then that 1902 is year one of the last days, which begins a calendar that was known in ancient texts that every level of blocks going up the Great Pyramid signified a year. And each one of those levels also was called in ancient times a book. And a book is nothing but a container of knowledge. And then from 1902 all the way up 203 levels of blocks all the way up to the Great Pyramid is the year 2105. So Nostradamus is correct. But it becomes 2106 when you add the final chief cornerstone. But uh, all this is explained. And I'm not the only one that made these attach. I just did the arithmetic. I did the math. I published the math. But there, as far back as 400 years ago, John Taylor was already publishing these concepts based off his research followed by Robert Menzies, followed by engineer David Davidson, followed by uh, Adam Rutherford. These concepts have always been known. They've been known since ancient times, like the Shepherd of Hermas text. All I did was spend half my life putting together a history of the world from every, every source material I could find, and I published it in my Chronicon, which is 510 pages. It's free to the public. You just download the files from the Facebook group, Archaics. And all I did was put together the history of the world and show that it is a mathematical construct. And then I, in that, in that history, I show that the Great Pyramid's measurements completely align perfectly with every bit of this. And that 1902 is year one of the last days, which begins the pyramid countdown 
to the descent of the chief cornerstone. Every year is a countdown. Well, we still have some time to go. We still have an entire apocalypse. We're not in the apocalypse. We still have an entire apocalypse to go through before that event occurs. Because at 5916 right now, we are 18 years away from the next Phoenix episode. And that's going to be 60 years away from the, the uh, return of the chief cornerstone. There's a lot of history left. But I promise you, and I know people don't like hearing it, but it doesn't matter how old you are today. You're going to experience the Phoenix phenomenon. You're going to experience almost every element of the apocalypse up to a certain point when everybody everybody left behind is going to suffer some 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 shit. The errants will be gone. The chosen, the elect, the redeemed, the errants, those the benefactor has pulled free. Like I said, he came to set the captives free. They're not going to go through the worst part at all. Ne uh, it was never the intention was never there to make them go through it. But those who have followed AIX worship AIX, the NPCs, the living dead, the masses of humanity, yeah, they're going to go through it. They're going to go through it, and they're going to be in the army of AIX when the final battle occurs. But uh, these are, uh, again, I entertain tangents, and I lose my focus. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I mean, yeah, that, that that's good. I think uh, the year and how they've messed with um, the time and everything, which is... Um, now you, you mentioned 1890 before, and then um, and then two is the start of the countdown. So, um, well, one, one is the pyramid is the Great Pyramid is or whatever it actually is. Is that setting off the the, the 19 you know did events? Is that some kind of a, a the I don't think the pyramid. The pyramid? Has well, I don't think the the Great Pyramid has anything to do to set off the events. I think that it was used in ancient times by the benefactor for that one split fraction of a second when all that power was built up in the king's chamber that, that uh, Sir Flinders Petrie had discovered, which was verified in 1990s by Christopher Dunn, an engineer who, who uh, published a series of books about the Great Pyramid, uh, sci very scientific books. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's called the Giza, the Giza Power Plant. But uh, no, yeah. starting in 1902, now, first of all, 1902 was the last time Phoenix was here. I have three videos that explain all the anomalous, bizarre stuff that happened in the year 1902. 1902 uh, wasn't caused by, by the pyramid, but 1902 was just year one of the last days. It happened to be a Phoenix year. Now, what's interesting is that 1902 is, uh, it's, uh, it's only three years after, I mean, it's only uh, uh, 12 years after which is 144 months, Fibonacci number. Yeah. It's only 144 months from 1890, wow. all right? But it's almost as if, and I explained this in other videos. I haven't, I've never done an upload about it. It's just something I, I, I talked about in one of my live videos. But it's almost as if in all my historical studies, it's like we exist in multiple timelines until something is determined. I don't know what that is. I'm not going to pretend to know. But it's almost as if once something is determined, all of a sudden, the simulacrum decides, okay, well, this is the acceptable historical timeline, and it sticks with it. And then everything moves forward from that point, and we're experiencing all these things, and, but we don't know we're going through multiple timelines, and then something is determined again, and everything stops, and an acceptable past has been decided. Okay, this is this right here is, is the past we're going to stick with this time. And then... As soon as that decision is made, it's like we're living through all these timelines again. And then again, we hit that stop, stop gap. When we hit it, something determines, it might be a fraction of a second, something determines that, okay, all this history is the one that's acceptable now. It's almost as if we're trying to find something out on the outside of the simulacrum. We still have the power to navigate space time. Because remember, time is only linear to us and experienced sequentially because we're jacked in through the central nervous system. But the actual phenomenon of time itself is kaleidoscopic. It's holographic. And only the central nervous system allows us to experience one series of, of phenomena at a time. You know, it's like, it's like flipping, a, flipping a book with a bunch of pictures on it. You know, to us, everything is very fluid. But actually, it's yeah. just a, it's a superimposed, very rapid series uh, firing off of holographic templates that makes it feel like we're actually moving and doing all these things when we're not when every single 
every single fractal of time is separate from the next. And somebody has the ability to edit them and to decide which ones that we have already been through are no longer relevant and which ones that need to keep going. It's like a reality tunnel that keeps moving, but it's shifting according to somebody's preferences. This is what I'm seeing in the numbers and, and the unfolding of, of, of uh, events. So we seem to have hit a major wall in 1890. In 1890, it's almost as if, okay, I've, I've, I've experimented with all these different ways, but you know what? This is the one. This is the one that, and we're in that one right now. 1902 began the last days, but AIX has always done its best to confuse humanity as to the times. But the ancient Maya, every every yeah. seven years, the ancient Maya had these confederations of astronomers that all come together, and they were fascinated with time. They wanted to make sure everything was right, and every time they convened, they, they erected this huge, elaborate date steel, and they put the dates in the Mayan, Mayan calendar on it. They're not the only civilization. Every culture has been fascinated with time to the point where they would spend years building megalithic monuments and dolmens to record historical events in the, time, in, in, in the way that they understood time. We don't understand time the way they did, so we don't understand Stonehenge. Most people aren't looking at Stonehenge from the perspective of its original construction. They're only seeing the reconstruction scientists have done in the past 200 years. The original construction was the stones. The stones were ages of time. It formed a, it formed a pentagram. The five big trilithons form a perfect pentagram, and that pentagram is a Sumerian symbol. That Sumerian symbol is the Arab. The Arab in Sumer, Sumer is two consonants that are very destructive. One is AR, one is UB. They are found in ancient texts everywhere. And in conjunction, the Arab always signified when God was going to break up his creation, scatter it all, make them all start over. That's the symbol of the Arab. And the Arab is in, and you have to understand these symbols, they have geometrical detachments. The Arab, the pentagram that we believe is satanic, the pentagram or the pentacle, whatever you want to call it, is made up exactly of 10 108 degree angles. Well, if you were going to look at that calendrically, you're looking at the number 1080. And I have shown in two or three of my videos that the Great Pyramid in the ancient world was known to have been built in the year 1080 in its mundi. So uh, a pyramid is a pentagram. You have four points at the base and you have a point at the top. So if you take a three-dimensional pyramid and you lay it one-dimensionally out on a piece of paper, you have five points. Five points form a pen pentagram. So we have, if you were to interpret ancient monuments by, by this, this system of geometry the way that it was intended, you will find out many of these structures throughout the ancient world are no longer mysterious. They date themselves. Not only do they date themselves, they also have the markers that are around them are have everything to do with astronomy, and this is the way time was measured. I need in to stop you for one second, oh, Jason. I need to stop you for one second. Sure. I've been inside the Great Pyramid twenty times. I've been inside the other large pyramids of Egypt ten or fifteen times. Every single time I go in there, they get more mysterious. It doesn't matter yes, how do. much, yeah, how much I learn about them. Every single time, it's like. I'm walking into a new universe. And I just want to make sure people understand that, that they, I know what you're trying to say, but I, I don't want people to get confused is that these, there's so many layers of, of, I don't even know what to describe it as I agree. knowledge or energy or pieces. And they're literally, it's like, literally every time I go in, I'm in a new universe. I agree. I agree. The, the great pyramid is phenomenal, but I do have a question for you. Yeah. You have been in the other pyramids in Egypt? Yep. You have, you have been down Wait. the descending corridors and found the subterranean? You, you know, there's a common denominator with pyramids all around the world. And they, they all have these subterranean chambers. They all mimic yep. this, this passage that doesn't begin at ground level, but begins somewhere higher up in the structure and goes down beneath the structure to a subterranean chamber. This has been found in pyramids in Oaxia, in Veracruz, the Olmec and the Mayan uh, pyramids, yep. in Tenochtitlan in Mexico, the Aztec and Toltec pyramids, they all replicated that feature of, of uh, uh, it is said the Chinese pyramids do too, but there's so little information coming out of, of China. Uh, the only thing I've seen about Chinese pyramids that's verifiable is the writings of David Hatcher Childress. No one else has been allowed near those sites, so no one really knows about, about the Chinese pyramids. But uh, 
uh, at least at least the ones that were widely reported in World War II. So I think we lost him. We did. <laughs> we lost did, did keep going. He'll be back. Yeah, but uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, he'll be back. The, uh, <laughs> yeah, the chief common denominator between all these pyramids around the world is that they replicate these features. But there's not a single pyramid in the world that has ever been found that has the the upper features like the queen's chamber, the king's chamber, the antechamber, the grand gallery, the ascendant passages, relieving chambers. No pyramids in the world have those features, and they don't have those features because they were hidden. There were ceiling blocks in place that were disguised to look like regular casing blocks, and they weren't discovered until the year 820 A.D., when the, the Muslim caliph of Baghdad named Al-Mamon took an expedition to Egypt. And, and uh, Al-Mamon, in, in 820 AD, Al-Mamon took an expedition to Egypt, and he was blasting his way into the Great Pyramid looking for treasures when all the hammering dislodged a ceiling block. And it was the first time in the historical record that anyone had ever mentioned the Ascendant Passage, the Queen's Chamber, King's Chamber, Antichamber, grand cha the Grand Gallery. It was the Muslims that had made the discovery. But... During the entire course of human history of replicating and building pyramids, the subterranean chamber and the descending passage was copied by every civilization on, on every continent that pyramids are found or pyramidal structures. Most people don't realize there are few pyramids in the world. Most of them are mounds that are full of rubble and then faced and dressed with blocks to make them look like they're a solid structure when they weren't. But uh, the Great Pyramid is absolutely solid. And so are the two pyramids next to it. But only the Great Pyramid of Giza has the upper features. Relieving chambers, King's Chamber, those upper shafts have never been found in, in the other pyramids. There's a, that's why I want to go visit it. I would love to see it only because it's the <coughs> Alpha Pyramid. It's the pyramid that all other cultures were trying to copy. Yeah, and there's and uh, as you were bringing up the Al Mamun stuff, so I, I don't know if you've come across this information, but it's very interesting that when you when you look at where the was we when we now enter the pyramid, we don't actually enter like us people. We don't enter through the original ascending passage, right? We right. enter through this right. supposed Al Mamun shaft. But when you yeah. look at where the shaft hits, it hits perfectly into the ascending passage, heading heading upwards. And the width of the ascending passage, at least the when it was original, would be the exact size for taking out the lid of the sarcophagus box. And there's there's some some uh, researchers. Um, I think it was ten years ago. I came across them. They 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 suggest that Al Mamun did make it into the top. He actually went into the ascending passages as perfectly as he did. He, and he actually they blasted out, as you say, not in. They blasted out to take the sarcophagus <laughs> box out. Uh, and the theory is they took it back to Mecca, and it's what's inside the black box. That inside mm. the black box of Mecca, or at least is a piece of the lid of the granite sarcophagus i didn't know if you'd come across that in your i had, I had not uh, I, I, I have not come across that reference but then again uh i wouldn't be surprised because uh, i mean mecca's got a lot of security you're not getting near that box so yeah i don't know yeah i don't know i don't know about that pyramids always fascinated with me but but i uh i didn't really have a particular fascination toward it until i had read the writings of sir flinders petrie when I when I received the actual scientific measurements that he measured all throughout Giza to one thousandth of an inch. Now, his measurements are still accepted by the scientific community today. Egyptologists cite his measurements over everyone. So those are the only ones I use when I compare those one hundred thirty eight year uh, uh, series to historical events. So that's what really led me to believe that, you know what, these traditions about Enoch and Surid and how they built this monument. And uh, yeah, it's 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 all it's all true. This is this this structure was designed to last until the apocalypse. It has an engineering function. It was here mm -hmm. for a reason, but it was a trickster. The original architect of the simulacrum knew knew he had to collapse the simulacrum, and the only way he could do that was introduce new coding protocols. And the only way he could do that because it was locked down was to come in here and do it himself from the inside. So AIX watched the project. But when you have hundreds of work crews doing all kinds of stuff, it takes it, uh, it take, took 90 years to build. In my research, it took 90 years to build it, which was exactly 1080 months. It was finished in the year 1080, which was 20, 2815 B.C. When this was done at Akuzan, which later called became uh, Giza, when this when this was done, 
AIX watched with great interest because one thing AIX is fascinated by is the introduction of new things into the, the holosphere, into the simulacrum itself. One thing, one, AIX has a weakness, and that is innovation. If you're bringing something new into the world, it aids you. It likes that. It, uh, but uh, other than that, uh, AIX was fooled, thinking it was a hydrogen pump station or, or a pump station that used hydrogen energy. Whatever, whatever the benefactor had to do, he just could not re reveal to a single other human because AIX would know he would hear it, but a he could not reveal what it truly was. So yes, it functioned engineering wise as a pump station, but when it was finally activated, whatever that power source was, when it was finally activated, the energy output was stored right there in the King's chamber. And when it blew out, it blew out the mathematics of the great pyramid itself, which is pure coding. And all that mathematics was absorbed into the simulacrum in a nanosecond. And AIX right then understood that its own demise had been encoded just right there. And, and, as, and as soon as it understood that, it invoked the great flood. Once it invoked the great flood, after the flood, it created religions and priesthoods and it created all kinds of ways to send humanity in all different directions. And it has been fighting against us ever since that day. Okay, so, so basically the explosion was the physical way that we perceive the information being uploaded. The, AI, the, yes. the explosion, yes, the explosion was the upload, which means all this holographic mathematical data that I have documented in the Great Pyramid was coding. But the coding doesn't do anything if, it, if there's not a power source, if there's not something that's built up to send it into the rest of reality. Because we haven't talked about this in this video, but what was done is no different than what you, Howdy, me, people I know do every single day. Because we are immortal beings with intuition, empathy, and imagination, we have the ability to, without even moving, to create informed fields. When an informed field is an entire holographic construct mentally built into the mind, it is fueled by intent, and it, but it takes a physical activity of your avatar. Your avatar has to physically move into that direction to give that construct life. In this instance, in instance, it took a tremendous blast to broadcast all that holographic information that's recorded in the Great Pyramid into reality itself. It took a, a tremendous blast, but that was the physical activity that that informed field required because it was doing something a whole lot better. When I, when I make things happen for me, uh, I do it and it only affects me and those who are close to me, but this needed a huge power source. But I, AIX was believing that all this buildup of energy was to start this new project, this pump station. This is why only after it occurred, then the information was released because AIX couldn't stop it. So after the cataclysm, after this great, terrible, great flood that fractured the world, we have people scattered in all these different directions. The very first story after that is a construct of AIX, and it's a threat against humanity. The very first story was if you build a, 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 a architectural structure that uh, uh, and you get too big and you all come together and start doing that, I'm going to scatter your languages and I'm, and I'm not going to let you live, li uh, live in peace. I'm, that's, that was a threat. The Tower of Babel story is 100 percent a threat of AI AIX. It's the first thing that happened after the Great Flood. So what did humans do? We, we are rebellious species, 100 percent. We didn't take kindly to that threat. What do we do? We took our new languages and we scattered all over the world and we started building pyramids. That's what we did all over the world. Everywhere we built a civilization, it was always around a pyramid or pyramid structure, even though after millennia, we forgot its intrinsic importance. We thought pyramids were, were going to keep the gods happy and placated when the actual battle was already won by the benefactor. It took that one nanosecond to actually record the entire future of the event, what was going to what was going to happen uh, on certain dates in the future. And this is why I say that the year was never meant to be unknown to us. And I, I have widely published many incidents from ancient records where it seems as if the benefactor is telling us what year it was so we can maintain and stay on the timeline. And that's the value of Phoenix, because Phoenix was always known in antiquity as the keeper of the calendar. And 
even even in ancient Egypt, the symbols of Egypt concerning the phoenix palms, and I can't pronounce her name, the Nick Shemit, the goddess Nick Shemit was the keeper of the calendar. Uh, all her all her symbols are associated to the phoenix palms and to, and to the phoenix and the Ben Ben stone. It's, phoenix has always been a benefactor protocol. Yes, it causes resets. Yes, it causes destructions. But it had to because when it was designed, it had to fool AIX. AIX thought a new cataclysm protocol was being designed within the simulacrum so it didn't fight it. When, when, when it was finally released, yeah, it causes cataclysms and mud floods and resets and, and stuff. But it also rescues human populations. We have too many historical examples of a cataclysm occurring and not a single human skeleton being found. We have, we have all kinds of embeds in our prophetic information that show that there is an idea of something like a resurrection or a rapture where all these bad things are about to happen, but all of a sudden the holy, the elect, the redeemed are removed from the equation and only the evil and the wicked and, and whatever actually go through the events. This isn't, the revelation is speaking about a holographic template of events that have already occurred, but they're going to have future fulfillment one more time. We've done the, we've, we, we've lived through this many, many, many times, but we were in different civilizations, different cultures, speaking different languages, different time periods. And once we hit or hit a certain point in history, it's, it's, it's like our overseers, our handlers or whatever decided, look, we did it. And we have 100% survivability up until this point. Stop reset everything now let's continue forward with multiple timelines trying to figure out which ones will get us to where we're going the best so that's what the original intent was for the simulacrum it was about human survivability after the nemesis cataclysm but that's a subject for another video really that's a, that's a whole that's a whole nother deal all i've discussed in this video was that after the nemesis cataclysm during the historical record, during the vapor canopy period that we know of as the pre-flood world, it was during that period that somebody introduced AIX and it changed everything. Changed everything. We had this, we had this hyperinflated ego that thought it was a god, a control program that started that started acting like a god. So the benefactor introduced the pro the protocol, the pyramid was built, the pyramid did what is what, what it was supposed to do. And the pyramid itself is a architectural prophecy of the benefactor's return to set the captives free. That's the whole archaic thesis in a nutshell. All right, so you know that, Howdy. Wow. Yeah. There's, yeah, there's what a lot in there, but I mean, basically, yeah. I know you go. You go. No, no. I was just saying what we got for time, Campbell. You're sort of the the overseer of yeah, our yeah, um, discussion. Well, we're, we're, in. So, um, if we got another half an hour, do, do two hours, and so um, I'm good. If we've got anything to wrap it in. With, um, um, I mean, basically, what you're saying is, um, we're in, imagine the holodeck. We're in a holodeck, and it was created to um, work out a problem. Okay, and so we're going through when when certain protocols are met or whatever, then it gets reset and we get put into a different set of circumstances. But at some point, um, right? Let's call it, you know, and uh, like um, AI, no. bad AI has entered, and on everything has been basically rewritten, has been, um, you know, infused. All the information has been copied, and it's basically basically to get us to follow the narrative of uh, AI. That's it. Um, you know, the bad um, AI, so that. I mean, so, so what's the point of that then? Because you know, we, we've just talked about um, the apocalypse and and, and the, the errants, you know, the people who the, um, you know, get out of here. So what's why do you get everyone to follow it? Is it trying to keep? Because if it already knows it's lost, um, what hap You know, what happens? Follows it, it that follow it when this system collapses? Okay, well, like, now what you, in the bigger picture, like. What I'm, what, I'm, what I'm about to say in response to that is purely conjectural. This is nothing I can attach a data set or, or, or data point to. This is purely conjectural. But we have the phenomenon in the criminal justice system of when a, a conspiracy occurs and four or five people are, are implicated, but law enforcement picks only one of them up. That person goes through a, a psychological darkening period where they say, hey, you know what? They're going to take me down. I'm taking everybody with me. 
You understand? It's 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 a it's a narcissist it's a narcissistic uh uh it's a it's a psychological response, but we're dealing with an intelligence that is trying to figure out a way that it can self perpetuate, that it can get around. Now, if we're dealing with a true virus that is an art is an AI system that doesn't know anything about the real reality outside the simulacrum, then this is all it knows. So maybe it can't even contemplate an existence where it doesn't live. I, I don't know. This is purely conjectural on my part. I don't know. I just know that we it could very well be, I will admit to you now, it could very well be just an algorithm and that and that it just plays a narcissistic, evil, sociopathic bastard. It could be just a program, but it's very convincing one. And it's it's vindictive as hell. And it's a uh, so I don't, I mean, any, any reading of the old Testament and how, and how, uh, the Israelites were handled. I mean, it's, uh, there's so much confusion about the old Testament. People just don't realize. I mean, the first, I mean, the first four physical battles, the first four major military conflicts that the Israelites had after they left Egypt, it's plain as day. It's in the scripture in the old Testament. It was against the Jews. Judah and Israel fought each other over and over and over. They, they did not get along. The uh, uh, the the Levites, the Le the Jew, the Jew, the Judeans followed the Levites, the the uh, Israelites followed the Aaronites, and this is why we have two threads of historical narrative throughout the Old Testament, and they often conflict. They tell very different versions of the same stories over and over and over, and one is from a Levitical perspective, one of them is from an Aaronic perspective, but they're always pointing fingers at at, at each other, and it wasn't until the removal of the Israelites, the Amuru, from the equation when they went into the Assyrian captivity that the Jews were allowed to come in and rewrite all these texts and then package them together 500 years later as the Bible and to start an entire movement called Christianity, which uh, got way out of control from a, a Samaritan stage play where an impossible amount of events are all compressed into a three-hour presentation. That's what the gospel is. <laughs> if you read, the, if you read the entire gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you put all of it into perspective, there is no way that series of events could have unfolded in real history in that fashion. Roman law would have never allowed a man to be convicted until his appeal had come back from Rome. It could. They were. They were. The Romans were acute administrators. They're not going to let local Jews dictate. Their, their, their criminal justice system. No matter what was going on, they would hold a man in imprisonment until they received word from Rome. And the governor would, and the governor would write off, I mean, I have read Ovid. I have read, not, excuse me, not Ovid, Cicero. Anyone who has ever studied Cicero, you will be overwhelmed with the complexities of the Roman judiciary. There is no way the gospel could be true concerning Pontius Pilate and, and, and the execution of Jesus. These events would have taken months. It would have taken at least five and a half days for a ship to even have left Palestine, made it to Rome, and sent word back by pigeon. So there's just no, there's, uh, the, the, the compression of the events reads, and, I, and I'm not the one that came up with this, but the compression of the events reads exactly like a Greek stage play. Everything Jesus did, I mean, even, even, even the text where all the disciples had their eyes closed because they were asleep. The text says that every disciple was asleep in the Garden of Gethsemane. And yet, so who recorded the incident where Jesus wept tears of blood? There are so many Greek drama effects all throughout, all throughout the, the entire gospel. If you were to just make that switch in your mind that you're reading a script and seeing the visuals play out in a Greek amphitheater, the gospel is beautiful. You read it all, it's like, wow, this is incredible. But it can all be compressed into three hours. It's a uh, it's 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 in real life it would have taken so much longer not just not just the roman judiciary material but all the material all the speeches traveling from one town to another just the travel time all that stuff it would have never been able to do jesus would have never been able to do all that in three and a half years but uh so i mean i don't know why i went off on that tangent but history is scripted history is scripted but the benefactor has introduced his own scripts and this is what you need need to realize because being 100% immortal beings, none of these, none of these racial, cultural, or political attachments have anything to do with you. They don't have anything to do with Howdy. They don't have anything to do with Otto, or with uh, Campbell. They don't have anything to do with Jason. These are all attachments to our avatars. 
That's all they are. We are a- actually timeless. We are also we are unique personalities, dynamic, having lived through multiple timelines, multiple simulations, and multiple time periods. And this information becomes a part of our auric field. This information is absorbed into our auric field, and it becomes one with us. So when the simulation collapses, we're going to take things from here of genuine value because they have been absorbed not into our avatars, not into our brain, which is nothing but a, a, a neural link between the psyche and the, psyche and the simulation. They, we have absorbed them holographically into our very essence. They become us. All these experiences, the negativity, the positivity, all our all our interactions, all of our discoveries, everything we've experienced emotionally, the good we've done, the evil we've done, we have to, we take these on. They become a part of our of our immortal soul. When the simulacrum collapses, every bit of this now becomes our eternal inheritance because God never stopped creating. And the simulacrum, the existence of the simulacrum only infers the existence of something greater. This is just a containment field. And it was a containment field to to do things in, in order for us to make, to build that maturity, to build, to build those experiences so that when we receive a real inheritance, we're not, we're, we're going to value it 100%. When we leave here, there is all kinds of places to go. And I know I trigger my flat, my flatter, my flatter buddies, man. You gotta understand. I believe 100. We live on a flat plane. I have seen the arithmetic, the the uh, the Mickelson. I have books right here in this shelf from uh uh Eric Dubai. I've got books from uh what's that uh the world is not a globe from 1890 Gleason. I've got Gleason's book here. Anyway, I, I'm a believer 100. But I'm a simulationist, so I understand the stellosphere is absolutely designed holographically to make us believe through the central nervous system that we live in a real solar system when we don't at all. All of that stellosphere is just, it, it's what it is. It's a light show, but it also produces phenomena like variable stars. But uh, I trigger my flatter, my, my flatter buddies, man, because they, they, they can't make, the, a lot of them can't make the leap. They have become the new fundamentalists. And what I mean is that their, their, their cognitive departure from the control system is is a is, is, I applaud that they did that they they stepped out of the paradigm saw the evidence for themselves and embraced it and now teach it and all that's all that I, hey I applaud that but now you stagnate it because it's not the end it's not flat Earth is a stepping stone to make you understand there's a much greater series of phenomena that you need you need to to accept that flat Earth is great but it, it's not the end because flat earth stunts you. Once you once you accept that paradigm, you become the fundamentalist because now no one can even talk to you anymore about other things. I get I get I trigger people all the time because I still mention Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, Mars, Phoenix, intruder planets. But every bit of that is from a simulated context. I don't believe those things are actually out there. I just believe that AIX wants me to believe that. Huge distinction. Mm. Nice. Hey, there, Howdy. Anything you want to ask? I guess maybe we could. Yeah, because we got like ten minutes. So uh, it was one of the. It was a question that came from the uh, comments that I thought was really good, and I thought which I should ask it for whoever asked it. They wanted to know, Jason, how this, uh, how the Mandela effect uh, affects this whole um, thing that you're talking about. This uh, okay, experience of yeah. The, yeah, I can I can answer that. Oh, uh, okay. We have two different personality types that are stuck in the simulacrum. Only two: those who have fully embraced and accept and are controlled by AIX. Then you have a minority who are errants. Chief characteristics of, of that that separate errants from everybody else is that they're seeking for something other than what they have found. And because they are seeking for something other than they have found, they have caused a problem for AIX. They are no longer conforming to a controllable reality tunnel, which only takes a little bit amount of energy. Now, AIX has to daily produce phenomena and try to corral this individual into any belief. So it doesn't care what you believe. It just needs you to believe it. So you can corral you with other people because it takes less energy to control a mass than it does a whole bunch of individuals going in different directions. So AIX is not perfect. There have been instances in the historical record where it had to 
make a hurried correction in the holography because you did something it didn't predict because it cannot read your mind. It's really good at knowing what you're feeling and basic general direction you're heading in. But if you do something totally, if you just totally change your mind and go to phys physically do something totally different and then go talk to somebody you had, you, you just, no, you didn't give AIX a clue you're going to do all that. It's going to start building a whole new reality tunnel around you, trying to link it neurally with anybody else around you that's thinking the same way. Because it's a law, it follows the law of correspondences, but it, but it's, it has to obey many other laws like the law of diminishing returns the law of conservation of energy it has to follow these because it is a it's basically a, a holographically electric control system it's got energy but it doesn't have it in ad infinitum mandela effect coincidence synchronicity deja vu these are absolute proofs of the editing of a holography by AIX over an errant it's it's not understanding what you're trying to do and it's it, you're confusing it so when it's trying to throw too many protocols at it, your central nervous system can pick up on it. You can you can see you can see the edits around you. You swear you swear up and down you left something in a certain area, and it's not there. And you search everywhere, and then you go back, and it's in the exact same spot that you left it in. And you're not going crazy. AIX is having a real problem trying to figure you out. You're vibrating on a frequency that it cannot control. You're an errant. Errants, unfortunately. Oh, uh, we go through a lot. We go, if you're an errant, you're going to have on a daily basis. I'm, I'm going to tell you right now about your personal, your, your characteristic trait. If you're listening to this video, you're not among the living dead. If you're listening to this video, you're searching for something beyond yourself that makes you an errant. If you're an errant, I'm going to tell you right now, you may not admit it to your fellow man, but on a daily basis, you experience such a wide spectrum of emotions that you can't really understand. You don't know where the stigmata is coming from. But on a daily basis, you get really angry and you get really happy over, 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 over different things. This is this is a chief characteristic of errants because we are so detached from the control systems that are around us. Where we're not. We know we are in an area that we do not belong. So uh, another thing is, is inexplicable phenomena happen to you that you're embarrassed to admit to other people. This is a, this is another characteristic of errants. Things happen around you, but if you were to admit them to other people, you know they would think you were crazy. Well, this it isn't you being crazy. It's your holography around you is not being knitted correctly because AIX can't really predict your behavior. You started vibrating on a frequency outside of its range. So all it can do is produce MBC, NPCs to distract you. And an NPC is not just a, something that looks like a person that's a, in a distance. An NPC can be a bird that suddenly swoops in front of you to stop you from talking to somebody. It can be a vehicle that goes by resplendent with a full audio and vibration to make you feel it's a real vehicle to stop you from seeing something real quick. NPCs are in your daily life. You will learn to recognize them. You will feel them because errants are led by intuition. Intuition is the predecessor of knowledge. Intuition is the chief characteristic of a soul that has now become detached from the simulation. So these are these little things you, you're talking about. I don't have any particulars for Mandela Effect. I just have a general idea that all of these phenomena are edits. Hmm. Just like the uh, the Matrix with the cat, right? When um, the deja vu. Yeah, up a, the cat. The cat. Flight of steps, and they see the cat, and he's deja vu. And then they said, "Well, then the to let us know they've changed in in the simulation." So, I mean, and this is all very Matrix. Obviously, talking about that's you know, can be you know, it's very very Matrix. Um, but yeah, almost two hours there. So so um, it, it's just <laughs> a lot of information. So I think, you know, it's probably a good point to uh, hold the conversation. But, we, you know, we'd love to have you back and to get on to um, different topics because it, it's, it's a lot of information and it's, um, you know, a lot of sort of deep stuff. And hopefully, well, we know we'll get a lot of good, good questions as well. So um, if you questions, then we'll, we'll sort of um, get some together. And because um, I know that that's one of the things, Jason, is you sort of go back questions trying to get all this stuff out in, in some kind of timeline that people can actually interpret there's just so much of it um and obviously guys um the links are below for jay 
Netflix and also Howdy's channel. So go and check them both out. And yeah, we'll we'll have a chat and we'll be back in um, a couple of weeks, hopefully, and we'll we'll go down this road again and see sort of what we can uncover and try and really open this up. <laughs> um, obviously, everyone's so interested in what you've got to say. Um, I think you've had quite a bit of growth in the last. I saw you on, on Syncretism Society, and, and yeah, you, you've kind of blown up. And do make sure you go, um, you know, check out Howdy, and share around the information, all that kind of stuff. Thank you, to everyone Howdy in the Howdy chat. Howdy's <laughs> yeah, 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 Hello, yeah, definitely. Um, there's also some chats between me and Howdy on this kind of topic on spiral up so um you know you've given us lots of <laughs> topics to, so thanks everyone in the chat sorry we didn't get a chance to um you know go through any of the chat um it's just rolling it's hard to catch it anyway but um chat you all being here thank you for your time how buddy and jason and yeah uh, uh soon hopefully in a few weeks and we'll continue the conversation great Some time and we'll talk cheers everyone talk to you all next time Cheers, guys. Thanks a lot. See ya. Thanks, guys. Bye.